I'll call to order the October 14, 2024 meeting of the Policy Review Committee of the Board of Education of Baltimore County. In accordance with Board Policy 8311, the chair of a committee at their discretion and after consultation with the staff liaison may convene an in-person committee meeting. Otherwise, all committee meetings will be held electronically. Today's Policy Review Committee meeting is being held virtually and broadcasted through Microsoft Teams Live on the BCPS website. To conduct this meeting by virtual means, all voting items this afternoon will be done by a roll call vote. Board members will say their names before making and seconding a motion as applicable, as well as when requesting discussion on an agenda item. Additionally, as a courtesy to the committee, I ask that you inform Ms. Wash, Ms. Pitts, or Ms. Howie if you must leave the call by using the team chat feature so that a quorum can be maintained. Ms. Pitts, please call the roll to determine the presence of a quorum of the committee. Thank you, Ms. Fempong. Present. Thank you. Ms. Harvey? Present. Thank you. Ms. Hen? Present. Thank you. Ms. Dulesky? Present. <clears throat> Thank you. Ms. Pumphrey? Present. Thank you. Ms. Pitts, please call the roll to determine which staff members are present in this meeting. Uh, yes, Madam Chair, I apologize. I did not call the roll for yeah. board member Ms. Chike Kalu. Oh, thank you. Present. Thank you. And Madam thank Chair, you, I think no worries. I will call the roll for our staff members. Okay, thank you. Yes, Mr. McCall. All right, Dr. Grimm. Present. Thank you. Ms. Hudson? Present. Thank you. Ms. Howie? Here. Thanks. And Ms. Wash? Here. Thank you, Madam Chair. You have a quorum, and I will pass the meeting back to you. Thank you. Thank you. The first item on our agenda, B1, is policy 0300, equal employment opportunity. Um, policy 0300 is on the 2024-2025 review schedule. Mr. McCall and Ms. Hutton, Hutton, please proceed. Good afternoon. Policy 0300 is the school system's equal employment opportunity policy. The board's equal employment opportunity policy supports the school system's core vision, purpose, and values by ensuring that there is a high performing workforce and that employees have positive and productive relationships. The Office of Equal Employment Opportunity is recommended that the policy be revised to one, add a commitment to employee education, two, define key words, three, clarify and expand the scope of locations where prohibited activity may occur, four, specify acts that constitute prohibited employment discrimination, and five, comply with the policy review committee's editing conventions. The policy prevented for the, pre presented for the committee's consideration contains the following revisions. In section one, the policy statement adds a new paragraph C to underscore the board's commitment to educating and empowering employees. Two, we've added a new section two definitions to define the terms used in the policy. Three, in paragraph 3A standards, we have added harassment or retaliation as acts that violate the policy. Four, in 3A, we have replaced in schools, school system offices with board property. Five, in paragraph 3A standards, we have added language um, events on a school bus or in any forum that substantially disrupts the school or work environment, including online activity as locations where prohibited activity may occur. Six, in paragraph three standards, we have added B to specifically delineate prohibited conduct. Seven, we have added legal references to Title VII of the Civil Rights Act of 1964 and the Pregnant Workers Fairness Act. Eight, we have re added related policy references to Board of Education Policy 0500, Workplace Bullying and Board of Education Policy 0600 Anti-Discrimination. And nine, we have inserted the Oxford comma where indicated as required by the policy review committees and the editing conventions. Um, as far as the equity lens considerations, 
The policy's main goals without amendments are specifically aimed at members of underrepresented groups. That is that equal employment opportunity ensures that persons who would otherwise be victims of discrimination have avenues of redress and know that complaints will be investigated and addressed. Therefore, the recommended policy changes do not worsen existing disparities, rather Party. changes. I'm sorry. Rather, the changes will positively impact employees who believe they have been treated unfairly by encouraging training and explaining clearly those acts that constitute prohibited discrimination. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Hunton. Is there any discuss discussion on the recommended changes to policy 0300? Ms. Hen. Yes, thank you, Madam Chair. I have a question regarding um, one of the changes on page two of the policy, if I may. Okay. With regards to the um, standards in line 30 that mention that it's a violation of policy, I understand we're striking that, um, but regards to where the violation occurs on board property, and then it mentions um, the specific settings where that occurs. Um, would it be a violation of this policy as written if that violation were to occur um, on employee property, for instance? And do we need to spell out the specific um, locations? I, we mentioned including online, but no matter where it occurs, would it be a violation of the policy? And if that is the case, do we need to strike the specific examples or um, specific mention that it needs to occur on board property? Thank you. So um, Ms. Hen, I, I will let staff respond since this is the policy that they manage but I'm not aware of any events that would be school sponsored that would be taking place on an employee's personal property. Uh, and I would think that an example might be helpful if you're aware of any incidents, uh, but I would be concerned if employees are holding school sponsored events on private property. Mr. McCall? And if I may, Ms. Howie, for instance, harassment um, and an action of retaliation against an individual for filing a complaint, for instance, any um, act of harassment against that employee that were to occur at that employee's home, for instance, um, would that be, would that qualify under um, the standards that are listed under this policy if they were to occur at the employee's home. And again, I'm trying to think of events that would be occurring. Obviously, if they're online, the individual may be home or maybe anywhere, uh, but I'm I'm struggling with when an employee could be retaliated against in his or her own home. The and that's not to say it couldn't happen. I'm just having um, difficulty with coming up with an example. Uh, the closest corollary I could provide members of the committee and Ms. Hen would be the scope of authority that we use under 5550 and 5560. So, for example, when students are um, disruptive in the community and there is an effect on the, um, on the school climate, then the school system, and there's a long line of case law, uh, the school system has the authority to take action against that student. Um, I'm, again, I'm, I would think that, uh, and I'm asking my colleagues to respond if they're aware of any cases or any instances where they've had such um, an issue in the employment uh, venue, 
um, whether or not there are instances where the scope of authority, if you will, that exists for students would be um, a corollary in the employment arena. Thank you. I'm, I'm happy to respond. Um, so I would say that if there is an incident that happened on personal property that was not a school sponsored activity, uh, we would be looking at it through a lens of is this something um, that someone was charged for perhaps as their harassing contact conduct um, that they have uh, been criminally charged for, and then we would be looking at it under 4100. Uh, and so I can really only think of um, if we have criminal behavior that relates to harassment, which we could potentially have uh, behavior that falls within the scope of both, um, that that could be addressed via 4100 um, via our provision that allows for us to take action uh, based on criminal charges, no matter uh, where or when the charges occurred, and uh, regardless of the outcome of that investigation. Thank you. Ms. Frempong? Thank you, Madam Chair. I just had a couple of questions. Um, so the first one was um, for um, Section 2D for line 18 for the, um, I guess, characteristics. Is it that military and veteran status are considered to be the same thing? I know in Maryland law, it says military status, but within our policy, I see that it says uh, veteran status. So is that just being used interchangeably or is it something different? Ms. Howard, do you have a response for that? I can't. I think you're muted. I apologize. That's um, okay. I believe that veteran status is what we use and have used throughout our policies. Okay. Thank you. So is it the same thing then as the military status as it's per, I think in Maryland law, I've seen where it's military status. So is it the same thing? When we're talking about those characteristics, I am not aware of which statute to which you refer, um, Ms. Frumpong. I would have to do some research to see if there is a separate protected category for military status. Uh, but I would hesitate to speak uh, because I'm just not aware that there is a distinction. Okay, thank you, Ms. Harvey. Um, oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead, Ms. Frumpong. Okay, I'm. I have. So um, the next one was when we talk about training, um, is that training for education as well as certification? And I need to go back to see specifically which area. And perhaps my colleagues understand, but if you could please explain what you mean by certification, ma'am. Sure. So, for example, OK, so, for example, when I think of um, under training, like education, going back to school to get your advanced degree versus like certification for national board certification. I don't believe that there was a certification anticipated by this policy when the division wrote the policy. Am I correct, Ms. Hunton and Mr. McCall? Correct. And then the, the last question was um, relating to with the analysis, and it talks about the equity lens consideration. So for line 17 through 18, um, it says that the changes will positively impact employees who believe they have been treated unfairly by um, encouraging training. So I guess, can you expound on that? what you mean, and then I guess provide an example of that. Ms. Hutton? Sure. 
Um, and so encouraging training throughout the system, we encourage um, A employees to be reporting in uh, discrimination and harassment um, immediately so that we can take prompt remedial action. And so by encouraging that training, we are able to address issues promptly and prevent them. And then if needed, do remedial training to prevent them from happening again. And so by encouraging that training, that does have the positive impact on employees um, who have been treated uh, unfairly or feel that they have been. So then for someone who is in violation of this and we talk about the training, is it like just encouraged or is it going to be required training to address the issue? So if we do find, if there's a finding uh, that someone has violated this policy, there are recommended recommendations related to this specific investigation. And those recommend recommendations go to the supervisor and the supervisor implements that action. And so that action is required. And if training were recommended that that training would be required and the employee would need to complete that training within the specified time frame. Got it, thank you. That's all my questions, Madam Chair. Sorry, I was muted. Thank you, Ms. Frempong. Ms. Harvey? Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. I think my question was answered. It was really a follow-up to Ms. Penn's question. I just wanted to be clear that, um, that there are other avenues that people would need to pursue if they are harassed by another school employee, but outside of the school day or uh, off school property, that the expectation would be that there would be uh, some kind of uh, law enforcement response and then the school would respond to that. Is that what I heard? That's correct. They would be encouraged to contact the police. Um, if there ever were, and Number one, again, if they were charged, we could address that under 4100. Or um, if there were any kind of action taken, such as a protective order that required two employees to be separate, um, that obviously in, in the workplace, that could impact the workplace, and then we could take action as a result of that. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Ms. Harvey. Any other questions or discussion? Ms. Selesky. Thank you. I just have a very quick question. Um, in Section 3A, the replacement words of harassment and retaliation, um, it's wonderful that we're adding the, the definitions to the document. Would those two words be added to the definition? Thank you. I mean, would those two words be added to the little, like, glossary or... Um, at the end of the document. Thank you. Uh, so I think I understand your question. Um, the definition section, uh, be, we have, we do have a definition for discrimination, harassment, retaliation. So let me ask, can, can you clarify your question? Um, yes, sure, thank you. I was just checking to see since um, the words harassment and retaliation are being used as like replacement words, would the definitions for those terms be included in the definitions that are at the end of the document? Ms. Selesky, if I'm understanding correctly, I think I think those are, are already under the definitions on page one and two. Are okay. You, are, is that what you're referencing? I just want to make yes. sure I'm also. Okay. Yeah. I do see those. I see that on page one, harassment is C. Um, and on page two, retaliation is letter E. Great. Thank you. You're welcome. Any other questions or discussion? Okay. If there are no corrections and no objection, policy 0300 is moved forward for first reader as presented. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, may uh, Mr. McCall and Ms. Hunton be excused? Yes, thank you both. Thank you. Thank you. Thank Next you. on our agenda is item B B2, policy 8320, final action by the board. And for that, I call on Ms. Howie. Thank you, members of the board. Uh, pursuant to policy and rule 8130, 
policy 8320 is on your uh, agenda to be uh, reviewed this school year. Uh, the policy concerns what is now titled final action by the board. It's staff recommendation to take out the word final. It's not terribly clear in this context. So that is our first recommendation. Our second recommendation is to change the word guidelines to standards because what is described as to the actions that the board takes really are um, not what you choose, which would be a guideline, but what's imposed on you by other authorities, which is more accurately described as a standard. Um, finally, staff is proposing taking out uh, the word final again uh, in uh, the policy statement and making action plural. Uh, there is one other um, suggestion that staff has. Uh, unfortunately, it didn't occur to me until I was reviewing the, the policy as it had been presented to you. Let me direct your attention to line seven uh, of the policy draft. You see that the word legal um, is included, followed by regulatory and parliamentary. When reviewing this again, my recommendation is that instead of legal, that the word statutory be included, be inserted instead of legal, because a regulatory standard is still a legal standard and a statutory standard uh, conforms better with um, state law, which is what statutes are, state law, and that um, is consistent with what is in the policy analysis. Um, I'm sorry, and I forgot to mention in line 19, we've added the words who are eligible to vote. As you're aware, uh, members of the board and Ms. Shikekalu, that uh, student members still are not able to vote on collective bargaining matters uh, or on matters related to the termination or suspension of certificated employees, as well as school closings and openings and boundary changes. So a majority of the board would change depending on whether or not uh, the student member is entitled to vote. And that simply clarifies that distinction that exists because of the voting rights of student members of the board. And with that, I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Ms. Howie. I have a quick question about your um, statement regarding staff's recommendation to change legal. I mean, to have statutory instead of legal on that on line right. seven. Do we need yes. Is that are we to assume that when we're voting, if we vote to um, if we call a motion to vote on this as presented, it would that would you need to make a motion to change that? Or are we to assume that your pr presentation is stating that legal should say statutory? So what you can do, uh, Madam Chair, members of the board, is um, ask if the uh, committee or members of the committee, ask whether or not the committee agrees to if there's any objection. If there's no objection, then when you vote on what has been presented, that would include statutory. OK, thank you very much. Uh, Ms. Harvey. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. My question is in the analysis. Mm -hmm. Uh, there is the equity lens consideration, Correct. which talks about the rule, but this policy is governing the board, and I'm wondering if that language can be put in the policy. Um, I'm sorry, where the, are you? I'm where sorry, you I'm on the analysis 36, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. first page 36. I'm wondering if that language in terms of um, uh, this policy requires the board to address equity lens considerations, including uh, one, two, and three and four right. um, as a requirement of the board's decision making. Because uh, okay. th this, in the analysis, it talks about the superintendent's rule, but this policy is really related to the board. Okay, um, happy to uh, address your question, Ms. Harvey. So um, as you're aware, uh, the superintendent's rule was changed to include equity lens considerations that had to be provided once policy analyses were presented. So the rule is, is imposing a requirement on staff 
so that when staff prepares a policy analysis, staff has to conduct the equity lens um, analysis. So it is a requirement for us, for staff, uh, to do this when we are uh, presenting policies to you. It is not in board policy as yet that requires that the equity lens be considered, but because the superintendent's rule is um, imposing a requirement on staff, it's the same effect. Does that make sense, ma'am? Yeah, I hear what you're saying. It's 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 there by association. Um, it's there by requirement. <laughs> staff right. does not have a choice. No, so, not staff. I'm talking mm -hmm. about it's associate because it's required by staff. It's associated to the board. I, right. I I get that clear connection. My um, I think my thought really was to be clear that the board is considering these things. Um, OK, I if, understand. If, if as a policy, if I'm a person just reading the policy, mm -hmm. I would not know that the board is required to consider the the uh, have these uh, equity considerations uh, outside of this analysis because the policy is silent on it. That's so correct. Only, Your so, policy 8130 does not include equity lens considerations in the policy itself as part of what has to be included in the analysis. If that's something that the committee wishes to be brought forward so that it is in the board policy, then that is certainly the committee's um, prerogative. So, Ms. Howe, I just want to make sure I'm clear. This is a, the change that you're talking about will be not in the current current policy that we're talking that we're discussing right now, but in policy 8130. Correct. Okay. So let, let me just um, give a broader lens, perhaps. Um, superintendent's rule. Uh, 8130, which I think is only the second role in your 8000 series, because as Ms. Um, Harvey noted correctly, the 8000 series relates to your uh, policies about your self-governance. So the superintendent can't tell the board how to govern itself. Uh, it is, but the soup, but the board policy, board policy 8130, which is, as you've heard me say, members of the committee, one of my favorite policies because it's a bureaucrat stream. It's a policy about policies. And that policy indicates here is how policies are to be considered by the board. They're to be considered by policy review committee first, and there is to be for each policy when it's presented a policy analysis. And that policy also indicates what's to be in the analysis when staff presents the policy recommendations to you. It must be accompanied by an analysis. Now, there's also a superintendent's rule 8130, which sets forth a seven year period for review of board policies. And it imposes on staff, the superintendent has done that through rule, the requirement that every time staff brings a policy forward to the board, staff must present in the policy analysis the equity lens considerations. That is a requirement that staff has. And that is why the equity lens considerations are now a part of every policy analysis that was done as of the end of last school year and the requirement began in this school year. So uh, that's probably a lot more information than the committee needed, but I hope that addresses Ms. Harvey's question. Uh, so Ms. Harvey, again, policy 8130 does not impose the requirement on staff 
to um, include this in the analysis, Rule 8130 does. And if your question relates to whether or not that means it's not required because it's in the rule, that would not be accurate because staff is still required to follow Rule 8130. And it's staff who presents the policy to the board to policy review committee. And um, just a comment for those who are listening or may listen later on to this to this um, to this meeting. Um, that first sentence under equity lens consideration in the policy analysis is consistent throughout all of our policy analysis. Now that first sentence that mentions one, two, three and four. I just wanted to make that clear. It's in every analysis at this point. And then after that comes the actual um, information. So while I, I understand that operational process, mm -hmm. what I am actually uh, trying to reflect is uh, our commitment as a board um, to equity. Mm -hmm. If we are asking that equity language and an ex equity lens be threaded throughout uh, everything that we do, we're asking that of the superintendent, I believe the board should have a parallel process and parallel language uh, in our policies. So rather than one policy where we put a statement in or not have any statements, but have it in the analysis, which again, if I'm just reading the policy, I won't be aware of that we include that we mirror the equity language in the actual policy. That's what I'm, I guess, proposing. So in can I just, I'm sorry. One, I'm sorry. Um, That's okay. Me. That's okay. I just wanted to clarify, Ms. Harvey, are you asking that for this particular policy or for uh, policy 8130 that you want that change? I actually believe it should be reflected in all of our policies. Uh, as the, a board. The language, it's the language itself. The yes, the equity okay. language, uh, because we are supposed to be reflecting a practice as a board, not just what we're holding the superintendent accountable for, but as a board. But I do uh, think that the equity, the language uh, that's in the analysis. Um, sorry, I'm flipping to it now. Um, I'm not sure why we wouldn't mirror that to say that the board will um, have these considerations whenever we consider what uh, the superintendent or the system is putting before us. And understanding that they're doing their analysis, but the analysis that you do mm -hmm. is is not an equal trans an equal translation of I considered it as a board member. I may receive it, I may read it, but I may have other equity considerations that are in these same categories. And I guess my question would be, uh, Ms. Harvey, is what that looks like. Because if the discussion that we're having now um, is because of the equity lens considerations, then, as you said, operationally, it has the same effect. If the desire of the committee and the board is that equity lens considerations uh, be a requirement of policy, then it, it again, the, uh, the committee can make recommendations to change board policy. To reflect those considerations. It would again the 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 committee if the committee wishes equity lens considerations to be explicitly referenced in board policy eight one three zero, then that can be the committee's recommendation. But operationally, you'll have the same effect because staff will still be preparing the policy analysis for the board's consideration with the same equity lens requirement 
it simply would be mirrored in board policy. So it would be in your policy, but it would be the same requirement. So I guess my question is, is it being in the policy an issue? Regardless of whether it's the same, if it's the same requirement, mm -hmm. what is the, um, what would be the downside of explicitly stating it in our policy? That's the committee's and the board's discussion to have. Uh, the reason that it was placed in uh, the superintendent's rule was quite, quite frankly, expediency. Um, you're aware, members of the committee, how long it takes for policies to get before the board to be approved. And this was, there was a sense of urgency that was communicated. And this was the way to get it done so that it could be in place at the beginning of this school year. So I am, I don't know if this is the appropriate time, you tell me, Madam Chair, but I am, uh, I, I'd like to make a motion to include the consideration language in the policy. So I guess my question would be, are you um, requesting that, if it's regarding policy 8130, I believe that would be something to request at the end, if I'm correct, Ms. Harvey? When we open, but if it's specific to this policy, which I'm not seeing it is, unless I'm misunderstanding. I I think it's a difference in. Because you want it for all policies, not just policy 8320. Correct. I would like the language, yes, to be reflected in our policy as part of our consider in our policies as part of our consideration. If if. Um, that is best reflected in 81, 81, 20. Um, that's one thing, but this policy is before us and it's talking about final action of the board. Well, not final anymore. Um, mm -hmm. and so I think if this is about our decision making, then it should be in this policy. That Madam Chair, may I comment? on this? Yes, Ms. Hen. Thank you. Um, and I appreciate Ms. Harvey's contributions here. I, I couldn't agree more that um, this needs to be inclusive or included in all of our policies in some shape or fashion. I, I think we need a more thoughtful and deliberate approach to it, um, perhaps, and would like to see the equity committee included in this work. Um, so perhaps this could start in that committee and come back to the policy committee for inclusion um, and get their recommendation on what that might look like. And perhaps we send this language to the equity committee. I would hate to circumvent the work that they're doing. Um, it might be a chicken or egg you know, type of question, but I, I would hate to circumvent them by um, moving this forward without including that group in the work. So I, I support what Ms. Harvey's trying to do here completely, but would like to see an inclusive approach and um, include that, that committee in the work. So I just wanted to, to comment. And thank I'm you, sorry. Ms. Harvey, for, for bringing this conversation because it's it's very important. Uh, no, uh, thank you, Ms. Hen. I am I am amenable to that. I think that would be an important addition to the work of the equity committee. Uh, we have the chair of the equity committee here as well. So I will let her, I will defer to uh, Chair Frempong. So Ms. Harvey, just let me go back because you wanted to invite a motion, but I believe you um, weren't sure when it was appropriate. So are we, let's go back to that motion. Do you still want to do that at this point? Uh, I, well, I will withdraw it um, for now, pending okay. Ms. Frimpong's um, discussion about working through 
our policies on the equity committee and making recommendations to the policy review committee regarding language per policy. Okay, thank you, Ms. Harvey. This is Ms. from Pong. So um, I just have a question, I guess, about the process. So uh, we've done this before last year with uh, policy 0100, where it came back to the equity committee for review. Uh, my only question, and so I appreciate that we have the opportunity to do that and have more eyes on this. Uh, my only question is if we do that um, with the process for PRC, does it mean then that we will not come back to this particular um, policy until the next school year, or will there be an opportunity for it to be returned to um, the agenda so that it does get um, continue the process during this 2024 2025 school year? So, if your question is whether or not um, 8320 will be returned to PRC, uh, that entirely depends on when. Uh, equity returns it to the committee and uh, what is on the schedule for whatever month it comes back. But it, so it would depend. I cannot give you a firm response. Okay, understood. So I guess, is there a deadline or what would be the latest date or the deadline so we know what the time frame is that we're working with? I don't think it has to take months, but just wanting to understand what is that time frame that the committee would need to be finished, the equity committee would need to be finished with its work and have it returned to PRC so that it can still stay as a part of the 2024-2025 school year. So I do not believe we have in the analysis the, uh, the dates when we proposed to take this policy to the board. Uh, Ms. Wash, uh, did you have a recommended schedule for when this was to go to the board? Ms. Howie, when what will go to the board? This policy before us? Yes. Uh, oh, okay. If it had gone forward this evening to yes. go to first reader to the board, when yes. would it be up for a vote? So it would be up for a vote on December 17th. I'm sorry, assuming for the sake of argument, mm -hmm. uh, Ms. Frempong uh, and Ms. Wash, uh, that the policy is returned to PRC, let's say in December, mm -hmm. giving uh, the equity committee time to work. Um, we do have a meeting in December, but not in January, correct? Correct. Okay, so again, assuming the worst, let's say that it's on the February agenda, when would it then be uh, presented to the board? March 25th. Be... Okay, does that answer your question, um, members of the committee? Yes, thank you. Mm -hmm. Ms. Ann, did you have another question? I did, thank comment? you. Mm -hmm. Yes, um, not on this topic, but on policy 8320, if we're ready to to move on, Madam Chair. Yes. OK, thank you. Um, on lines 12, I believe. Let me find my place again. I'm sorry, line 13 and line 19 um, of the policy. Um, line 13 states a majority of the members of the board shall constitute a quorum. And in line 19, um, or 18 and 19, rather, no motion or resolution shall be declared adopted without the concurrence of a majority of the whole board. I believe in both instances, we're referring to um, a majority of the whole board and that that definition refers to a majority of the whole board. And my question is, should that language be consistent in both of those instances? versus um, in line 13 when we refer to the members of the board. And the reason I mention that is because the statute mentions a distinction between members of the sitting board versus um, members of the, the whole board being 12. Um, at any time that number can fluctuate and members of the board could refer to either the current the total number of sitting members of the board 
versus the majority of the whole board, which is always 12. So my question is to Ms. Howie um, as to are we referring to a majority of the whole board on both of those lines and should the language be consistent? Um, if so, my recommendation would be that we use the same language, um, a majority of the whole board in line 13. So, um, Ms. Hen, the language majority of the whole board is a direct uh, quote from Comar 13A02101, uh, which is rules for meetings. And that is unusual. Um, it's it's non-parliamentary, non-standard parliamentary terminology, which is why it's included because it's required by regulation. Uh, quorum, however, is not set um, in state regulation. Only um, how you declare a resolution or motion adopted. That is a direct requirement of state regulation. So it was not um, included. It was not an exclusion that was um, that was an oversight. It was an exclusion because parliamentary standards are different than the standards in the state regulation. I see. So because it's not specified, that's why it's not included on 13. Got Correct. Although we could specify in policy, should we wish? Is you that can. correct? You absolutely can, ma'am. Okay, so I would then pose the the question to my colleagues, um, and to, and to clarify, should we? And I may need help ex explaining this. If we want to include it in policy that um, majority to constitute a quorum is always seven because that's the majority of 12, which is the um, the whole board, the, the definition of the whole board as it's currently defined in statute, then we would change the language on line 13 to specify um, a majority of the whole board shall constitute a quorum. If we leave it as is, a um, majority of the members of the board allows for quorum to be established with less than seven, should there be less than 12 members seated at any one time. So for instance, we've had 11 seated, and Ms. Howie, please jump in and, and correct me if I'm misstating anything. Um, if we've had 11 seated members, 10 seated members, and so forth, then majority could be less, and that would constitute a quorum. So, um, as you that may would not recall, apply for committees, however, yes, it would not. As you recall, Ms. Hen, we did have um, a member pass away some years right. ago, and yes, at that time, the question, which was uh, decided by the state board, looking at its own language as whole board whole board did not mean the persons who were seated, but the number of members of the board. So with respect to the number uh, that constitutes a quorum, if an individual member is not eligible to vote, then my argument would be that that individual could not be counted for the purposes of quorum. Does that make sense, ma'am? Yes, ma'am. I, I don't recall that particular nu nuance being discussed at that at that time. I do recall the other issue with the state board ruling that even though we only had 11 seated members, that the 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 membership of the whole board was still considered to be 12 members. Correct. That is correct. I, I do not I, I did not recall the the other issue of establishing quorum. Um, I don't believe the state board ever addressed the quorum issue. Again, the quorum issue is is established by parliamentary right. procedure uh, and not by state regulation. So 
you as a board can, uh, with your own, what uh, Roberts would call bylaws, with your own policy, determine how a quorum is to be established. That is completely within the board's authority. And, and to confirm, that is only on matters in which the student member is ineligible to vote, that the quorum um, would change. For instance, if we had established quorum and an item was on the table that the student member was ineligible, let's say the student member was counted in, as part of the quorum or quorum was met, including the student member and an item was um, being considered that the student member was ineligible, then quorum, we would lose quorum if we did not have another eligible member, if we had exactly the number needed for Correct. quorum, is that mm -hmm. we would lose quorum? Okay. Yes, ma'am. So Madam Chair, my, my question, um, before the group then would would be, do we want to consider um, specifying in in policy the definition of members of the board to to take out any ambiguity in in other words that defining it to be a majority of the whole board shall constitute a quorum or do we want to if we leave it as is then miss howie how would you define it as is then according to parliamentary procedure so uh again roberts uh defines quorum as the number of eligible members. So if the member is not eligible or in good standing at that per, at that point, that member could not be counted toward, towards quorum. Ms. Frempong, did you have a comment? I did, thank you, Madam Chair. I was trying to follow um, and I'm going to put some numbers here because it was a little bit abstract. With that example that Ms. Hen just gave, she said if we had quorum and then that included the student member, if we then had an issue where we don't have the student member is not eligible to vote, then we wouldn't have quorum. But if I understand, based on us having a, a 12 member board, our quorum is seven. And if we include the student member in that and then we lose the student member, um, because that person's not eligible eligible to vote, that would bring us down to six. But then that would still be a quorum because we would have 11 members who are eligible to vote. Is that correct? So then we would still, I guess, so then it's, it's not an issue per se um, with that example that was just provided. It would not be an issue for us. We would be able to conduct our business. May I respond, Madam Chair? Yes, Ms. Hen. Thank you. Um, correct. As currently written, that we would still have quorum, and and that would, I, I believe, I'm confusing voting with um, quorum because that would also be the majority needed um, to pass a motion if eleven members are eligible to vote. Six are necessary to to pass a motion because that would be majority of 11. If we were to change it to require the full um, membership, then it would require 12. As the whole board, but yes, what you stated is correct. We would still have quorum with six. Sorry, Any, I hope I didn't confuse that <laughs> even more. <laughs> <laughs> I um I feel that Robert's rules covers this, so I don't see the necessity of clarifying any further. I don't know if any other committee members have more comments regarding Ms. Hen's proposal.
Okay. And I was seeking to just to clarify it, but it sounds like it muddies it even further. Um, in in order to, to define, add clarity or definition to the policy, because we have two different definitions under the standard section, so that it's clear um, to our public and also to um, the board reading this. And I'd be open to any recommendations from staff here because I think there is room for additional clarity. I'm just seeing it as two different A is and C is two different. Like A is talking as speaking to quorum and C is speaking to our voting, which are two different. That's why I don't see the need to make it for both to reflect the same language, I guess, as my is my comment. Agree. And and because they both use the same language, a majority of the members of the board and then a majority of the whole board. Mm -hmm. My my question looking at that is what is the difference bet between those and understanding the, the difference between them? Because they are they are different. For instance, if the the full board um, or if we have a vacancy, it's a very unique situation, one that I hope we we don't have to face or the future boards don't have to face. But. Um. OK, so um, based on this discussion that we had for this issue and the prior issue on the same policy, 8320, am I hearing that we have. And are we object? Am I hearing that we have objection at this point to move this policy forward for first reader? I thought I heard um, a request to send this policy to the equity committee. Okay, so yes, that is the request. So um, at this point, do I need to do we need to vote for that? You just see Ms. if there's Hay any objection, and if there's no objection, that will be moved to the equity committee. Okay. Are there any objections to moving this forward to the equity committee? Madam uh, Chair, Hatt, may, I'm sorry. May we, yes. May we um, combine this motion with a or do a dual motion to also ask staff to take a second pass at the standard section for any points of clarity to the standards around um, 2A and C? So it's, it's it's preferable in parliamentary speak to do one thing at a time um, because number one, it you, you keep track, you're able to keep track um, and there are two kind of divergent issues. So uh, just in order to to make sure that staff is uh, is following the direction that the committee is given, my request would be that the that that's made clear as to what's expected. Okay. Okay. So at this point, do you have any objection to moving this policy to the equity committee? Okay. Seeing no no objection, the policy 80, 8320 will move to the equity committee for um, be referred to equity committee for review. And then Ms. Han had asked for additional review by staff, but I was not sure of the scope of that request. Sure. I I can. Um, speak very briefly to that. Um, specifically, I would like to see a definition of a majority of members of the board under 2A and a majority of the whole board under 2C. Okay. Any objection to um, referring uh, uh, policy 8320 back to staff per Ms. Hen's suggestion? Okay, seeing no objections, we will also move. Yes. I'm sorry, Madam Chair. Go ahead, I just Ms. wanted a clarification because the first the first was moving it to uh, not moving it forward and having the staff review it additionally. And then it sounded like it was uh, a specific language request. Are those so which one are we? So we've already agreed to send it to, uh, to the equity committee for review. No, I'm talking about oh, the, the A and C. Uh, Ms. Hen's concern around the language for those two. 
particular sections on quorum and voting. The first one was to send it back for additional review. And then when you asked for clarification, it was to include this language. So I'm just trying to be clear on what we're considering. Ms. Are we considering the specific language that Ms. Hem proposed? Or are we considering sending it back for additional review? We're considering, my understanding is we're, we're cons we are considering sending it back for additional review in reference to that language, but there's not a motion to change a specific language. So we're not proposing any specificity here as far as the language itself. Is that correct, Ms. Hen? Yes, it's just okay. to, it, I was just providing more specific direction as to which language to review. <laughs> All right, thank you for the clarification. Mm -hmm. And Ms. Howie, is that clear for you on your end as far as for staff, do you, do you think, because this conversation has gotten a little cloudy at this point for me as well. <laughs> it's as clear as muddy water, man. <laughs> Thank you. Any objection to moving this to staff for further review? Okay. Thank you. I think we're back on track now. Um, Thank you, Ms. Howie, for that. Surely. And next on our agenda is item B3, policy 8330, minutes. Uh, and then again, we call on Ms. Howie for this. Thank you. Members of the committee, policy 8330 is on your schedule for uh, the 24-25 school year. Uh, the staff is recommending minimal changes uh, to this policy uh, simply in uh, on line 10 on page 2. Uh, we wanted to clarify that the the board convenes administrative function sessions. Uh, as you're aware, administrative function sessions don't necessarily start in open session. So we thought that that would be clearer uh, to the public and it's also clearer in terms of process. Secondly, in subsection three, which starts at line 18, um, because there are two separate issues referenced in subsection three, one being access to your meetings, we're recommending that the title be changed or subtitle be changed to accessing board meetings and board minutes. We no longer use webcast, so we're recommending that that be removed. And finally, um, the access to board minutes has un is unchanged. So the process for board minutes prior to 2000 is to contact the, uh, the board office. And after 2000, those are stored on your website. Happy to answer any questions. Okay, um, any discussion on recommended changes to policy 8330? Ms. Hen, I see your hand is raised. Oh, I'm sorry. I I should have lowered it after the last one. I don't okay. have any questions. Thank you. No problem. You're welcome. Ms. Zaleski? Ms. Zaleski, do you have your hand raised for a comment or a question? Oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. That's okay. That's Thank okay. you. Um, in section three, um, where webcast is being removed, Mm -hmm. I don't know if it would make sense to replace it with um, like the live stream BCPS TV or some other um, updated label with accessing the board meetings. So but the concern with referencing a specific software was the reason we took out webcast uh, because that's what was used, you know, however many years ago. I don't know if prior to um, any other review of this policy, there would be some other modality it would be used and it would not be via the TV station or live stream. Okay. That was the only reason. Yeah, and that makes complete sense. I don't know how many people would use the actual policy to find out how to access the meetings but I don't know if there would be a phrase or term that we could use without specifying. I don't know. I I mean, I just, if, if there are a small minority of families that would use the policy to then learn how to become engaged, mm -hmm. I just would want them to be included. If totally. that makes sense. No, it makes perfect sense. Um, and again, online is broad enough, at least it is at the moment. Okay. Uh, given current, um, given uh, 
currently what we know, uh, but it is possible that who knows when could change. Okay, thank you. And um, just one other quick question in section six, which deals with the permanent records defined. Um, I'm sorry, which deals with the permanent records. I don't know if it would make sense to clarify um, the number of years that the records are retained or if you feel, and I trust your judgment, that just having it the way it is would be suitable. And thank you for your response. Well, first of all, I appreciate um, that comment, Ms. Uh, Ms. Tulesky, it means a lot. So uh, permanent, uh, and this is one, one of the things the state archivist um, reminded me of, is something that the state archives have done since the 1600s. Uh, so your uh, one of the documents that's referred to in this uh, policy uh, is your records retention schedule. Your retention schedule, which is C1458, indicates that we retain here uh, 50 years and then we transfer to the, for permanent records, then we transfer to the state archives for them to guard as they've guarded things since the 1600s. So that is in your uh, your records retention schedule, that it's 50 years and then a transfer. Okay, thank you. Surely. Ms. Frempong? Thank you. Um, Ms. Daleski um, had me think of an additional question or just maybe for clarification. I, I understand that right in the policy, we would just have online um, with regards to our first question um, that we would just have online. Um, but maybe is it something um, because just like you spoke about earlier, Ms. Howie, that rules can be, it sounds like the process for change can be quicker than um, our policies. Is that something that could be, or would it typically be included in the um, rule that's going to accompany this policy? So, where she was asking about, you know, via putting something specific to say BCPS TV, et cetera, is that something that can be included in the rule? Uh, we do not have a rule for this policy. As you see, okay. the implementation is the board shall implement this policy. If you mm -hmm. only have two rules in the 8000 series. These are your um, internal operations policies. So it is how you determine how you want to govern yourselves. Okay. 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 Thank you. Um, and then my question about this one was there is language. Um, about the minutes, but really this this is mainly pertaining to open session. Um, and so for our closed session, are there any, uh, is there any policy or, or something that we should be referring to for our closed session minutes? I'm not sure I understand the question. So when I was reading through this policy, it talks about, it, so sections like 2B, and to C, mm -hmm. um, where it says content of minutes and content of minutes and recordings. Mm -hmm. um, and then it says if the board meets in closed session, then the written minutes for the board's next open session shall include one through four. And then if the board has the administrative function, then the minutes shall include one and two. But it mm -hmm. still comes back to um, what is available um an open session and so i'm i guess what i'm trying to understand is when we have closed session um or we go to administrative function mm -hmm. there are minutes that are captured there as well but i guess i wasn't understanding where is there any reference in this policy to what should or should not be contained in the minutes that are taken specifically during that administrative function that would not necessarily be um, open to the public? There are not. Mm. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Surely. Any other comments or questions?
Okay, if there are no corrections and no objection, policy 8330 is moved forward to first reader as presented. Thank you, Ms. Howie. Thank you, committee members. Uh, next on our agenda is item C, unfinished business from the 2023-2024 uh, the school year. Um, item C1, electrify BCPS. At our June meeting, we received a presentation from our students on their proposal to purchase and operate electric school buses. Dr. Jess Grimm is here to provide additional information about this proposal. Dr. Grimm, please proceed. Hi, good afternoon, um, Chair Pumphrey and other members of the board. Thank you for having me this afternoon. Uh, the Division of Operations has reviewed this resolution, actually met with that group of, of students and a few adults uh, before they came to, to the PRC. And while we believe it's a worthwhile endeavor to strive for and to keep in mind for the future, there are several challenges posed by the mandates of the resolution, making it untenable for BCPS to operationalize at this time. Uh, several statements in the resolution are of concern, including the cost to purchase and maintain some electric equipment and vehicles. While there definitely are grants and programs to help offset the purchase price of some of these equipment and vehicles, for example, the cost to service, maintain, and or replace electric components is not widely available for some of them, and it's cost prohibitive for a system as large as BCPS without such technology being commonplace yet. Further, there are some vehicles that have not yet been effectively electrified, and the language of the resolution would commit BCPS to the purchase of vehicles that would not meet all of our needs. This resolution would result in BCPS incurring significant costs to upgrade infrastructure in order to charge equipment and vehicles, which has not been budgeted and is not presently in place. The resolution also states that the Climate Solutions Now Act of 2022 requires all new school bus purchases and contracts to be electric by 2025 in Maryland. While that is true, and the resolution does stipulate that the requirements do not apply if the county board is unable, unable to obtain federal, state, or private funding sufficient to cover the incremental costs associated with contracting for the purchase or use of school buses that are zero emissions vehicles. Thus, all these kinds of requirements are definitely funding dependent. The purchase price of an electric school bus is roughly three times that of a conventional model. And while there is some data to indicate the life cycle cost or the cost of ownership for an electric school bus is less over time than a conventional school bus, there's insufficient data to substantiate this claim as electric school buses have not been able and in use long enough for actual comparison. And we're excited that we have electric school buses now on our fleet so we can begin to compile this data here in BCPS. Also of note, Montgomery County Public Schools, who made a commitment a few years ago to completely electrify their entire school bus fleet of over 1,000 school buses by 2035, moved away from that position last school year by purchasing 97 conventional buses when they discovered several limitations with the electric buses they put into service during the 2022 or 2023 school year. While much of this response is focused on the vehicle aspect of the resolution, there are other elements of infrastructure that are not budgeted nor in place relative to landscape maintenance equipment, generators, and appliances, for example, that make this resolution at this time cost prohibitive. Thank you, Dr. Grimm. Any questions for Dr. Grimm? Okay, thank you. Thank you. Uh, next on our agenda is item C2, artificial intelligence update. And um, for that, I call on Ms. Howie if she's still available. Yes, she's still available. I'm thank still you, Ms. Here. Howie. Yes. Thank you, members of the committee. Uh, as you know, in September of 2023, you received uh, information about artificial intelligence. The question was posed as to whether or not uh, there should be a board policy on artificial intelligence. And Mr. Agosto at that time gave an update and an explanation of chat GPT. There was a follow-up in February of 24 
and it was recommended at that time that any possible board policy be delayed uh, until further study was done, particularly um, what was going on at the state level. I'm here today to provide you with a further update as to what has happened at the state level and what staff thinks should occur. During the 2024 legislative session, um, House Bill 1297, Senate Bill 979, excuse me, Senator Hester and Delegate Young presented uh, guidelines and a pilot program for education concerning artificial intelligence. That bill failed, and that bill would have required local school systems to develop inventories of AI systems. It also would have required local school systems to hire an employee to advise on artificial intelligence. However, Senate Bill 818, which is now codified at Chapter 4, or now uh, signed into law as Chapter 496, the Artificial Intelligence Governance Act of 2024, does require the adoption of policies on the state level by the state DOIT. It also requires that prior to, or I'm sorry, by uh, December of 2024, uh, that each unit of state government must conduct an inventory of its systems that employ artificial intelligence. It also requires that the uh, sub-cabinet, the governor's artificial intelligent, intelligence sub-cabinet of the governor's executive council, complete what they call a roadmap of risks and opportunities involved with AI, which has to include, among several other things, a plan to use AI in local school systems. That has to be done no later than December 1, 2024. I have reached out to the State Department of Education to see whether or not there's been any movement at the state level, uh, at the State Department of Ed level, to how they're going to give this roadmap, uh, because obviously they'll be uh, advising the sub-cabinet. Uh, there is no movement as yet and no information as yet. I therefore continue to believe it's premature for the board to have a policy at this time but we'll come back to the committee once there is the roadmap that has been proposed or that's been required by state law. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Howie. Any questions from committee members? Okay, next on our, our agenda is item D, Committee General Good Good and Welfare. The floor is open to members of the committee to discuss issues of concern. I must emphasize that this is not the time to conduct business as there has not been notice provided as required by the Open Open Meetings Act. Um, Ms. Stileski, I see your hand raised. Thank you. I just wanted to backtrack to um, Ms. Howie's update on the artificial intelligence, if I may. Okay. Thank you. Um, and I don't know who else from our committee attended the um, artificial intelligence session at the MAVE conference, but the conclusions at the conference um, do support, Ms. Howie, what you were stating about it not being necessary at this time. Um, they acknowledge that the developments are happening so, so quickly, but there's no evidence that students, in terms of their uh, preparedness for the world or for their 12 year education career or future career would be jeopardized in any way without AI and without incorporating it. And that um, all of students in Maryland will be more than prepared for the world without any kind of concerted effort related to AI. So thank you for your update as well. Thank you, Ms. Soloski. And although I didn't attend that session at MAVE, I did attend a similar session at the Advocacy and Equity um, Institute convention a few months back, and the same um, the same information was reiterated. So I agree. Thank you. Ms. Hen? Thank you, Madam Chair. I wanted to go back to Dr. Grimm's update on the electrifying um, bus resolution and ask whether or not any action from the committee is needed at this time. Um, including rescinding the resolution, if that would be appropriate. Is Miss is Mr. Grimm still on? Dr. Grimm is not still Dr. on. Dr. Grimm, I'm sorry. I don't recall that there was any action by the committee 
uh, the committee did not uh, pass or adopt the resolution that was proposed by the students. Thank you, Ms. Okay. Howie. I was thinking of an, an another resolution that the board had passed previously, I believe, about the, the electrifying of, of buses. I thought Dr. Grimm said there was a resolution from 2022. Perhaps I misheard. I'm, I don't recall that. But he stated. Okay, it may have been in reference to something else then. Okay. Thank, Thank you. So no sure. action that was for information only. Yes, not because the, a recommendation the had, to the board. This, yes, the students had presented to us, Miss, and I believe, I'm not sure if you were on the committee at that point. I and that might be where the confusion is because the students presented um, to the to PRC as well. And um, Dr. Grimm followed up and, as he mentioned, met with his group, met, met with them to discuss this. So I think that's where the that's where the um, that's what he was speaking to. OK, there was um, a resolution or recommendation by Dr. Williams some time ago about the electrification <laughs> of buses that the board had supported. So that's what I'm thinking of. And it was some time ago. OK, OK, thank you. Thank you, Ms. Hen. Any other comments also or um, discussion issues for general uh, committee general good and welfare? OK, thank you. The next meeting of the policy review committee is scheduled for Monday, November 11th, 2024 at 430 p.m. Because there is no further business, the meeting is now adjourned. Thank, thank you, everyone. You, members. Enjoy your thank evening. Thank you. You too. Good night. Good night, good evening, everyone. Good night.